should have this first. Hi, I'm Sal. And I'm Claire. And we are very excited to be here. And wasn't that cool? <laughs> We've been planning that for weeks. Um, it is just very cool to be on this giant stage with this giant audience. And isn't this just the best conference ever? I really want everybody to a huge round of applause to say thank you to Mary and all the people from White October Events. They work really hard. So can we just, yeah. And because we're so excited to be here, we're going to take a little selfie, if that's all right. Is yeah, it just with you all in the background. <laughs> yeah, just press, press that and it'll go. Oh, no, it won't. While she does that, I have to say, <laughs> we are excited to be here. But that's really just a perfect reframing of the fact that it is a little bit terrifying being here as well. So if any of you in the audience are thinking you would quite like to do a talk, if only you were like all the speakers, you don't get nervous at all, etc., etc. trust me, we have all been, have we not, speakers, terrified coming up here every single time, no matter how often we do it. It's scary, but we do it anyway, and you can too. Yes. Right, there you go. OK. <laughs> OK, everybody, put on your smiley faces. Wave. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Oh, one other thing. So one of the things that I absolutely love about this conference is the diversity. Uh, and one of the things about that is that this is a room that's got a really high number of female tech leads in it. And I'm not sure she'll thank me for this, but one of them is my colleague Alina, who works at ThoughtWorks, and it's her birthday today. So can we have a round of applause for Alina? <laughs> Happy birthday, Alina. I'm not quite sure where she is, but anyway. So the final okay. thing that we're really, really excited about is the thing that we're actually talking about today, which is so exciting. Claire, do you want to tell them? Yeah. Next slide. Oh, don't go, give it to me. There we go. Right. OK. Actually, no. <laughs> I'm not going to tell them yet. Can we just save it just a little bit longer? But this is Hack Manchester, which is an annual hackathon in Manchester. It's a very big event. This is last year. There were 57 teams. We were one of them. We were very excited. We had a lot of fun. Um, not only is it very big, it is a 25-hour hackathon, which means that people stay up all night. And the reason it's 25 hours rather than 24 is because they always do it every year on the weekend that the clocks go back. And what this means <laughs> is that there is a very perilous hour in the middle of the night. Now, I tried Googling this earlier, and I couldn't find out. I'm pretty sure it's between 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock in the morning. And what happens between 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock in the morning is you do not commit code. Because if you commit code at quarter past 1, and then you commit code again at 10 past 2, it's not 10 past 2, it's 10 past 1. And you already committed code at quarter past one, and you've now gone back in time, and GitHub doesn't like it. So <laughs> don't do that. It breaks all the things. And so this is our team for Hack Manchester. Um, uh, Claire and I, I change my hair a lot, so I look a little bit different, but I promise that's me. Luce and Cynthia. Um, so 100% all women, um, also 50% autistic. I am autistic, as is one other person up there. Um, so clearly in this talk, there will be no jokes, there will be no empathy, and there will be absolutely no sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like a paradox? <laughs> OK, yeah, I mean, like, we were super happy, as you can tell in the picture, because we built a time machine. This is our time machine. Oh, and this is not my puck, because every time I've rehearsed this talk, I've forgotten the puck. So we used PUCK.js, which is an IoT device, and it looks a little bit like this. This isn't it, because I forgot it, but I'm quite pleased with myself, because I had a look around my hotel room, and I thought, thought what can I find that looks a bit like a puck, because nobody's going to know anyway. This is actually a toothpaste lid. Uh, but <laughs> I know, but I'm just so proud of myself for thinking of it. Uh, and, and also, it goes click. Can you hear that? <laughs> so anyway, yeah. The way that the time machine worked 
was that we considered two use cases. So the first one is, imagine you work for Evil Core. It's three o'clock in the afternoon. You've been at work since seven o'clock in the morning. You're knackered, and you know it's going to be a long time before you're going to get to go home. So what do you do? Well, you click your button, and your app will allow you to go to sleep. Let's say for 20 minutes to have a caffeine nap, which is this fantastic concept that Sal introduced me to, which you might want to Google. Have a caffeine nap. 20 minutes later, your app will wake you up. OK, yeah, so what? But this is the clever bit. The app will then reset the clocks back to the time it was when you fell asleep. It's 3 o'clock again. Now, it doesn't only reset your clock. It resets your whole company's clocks. It resets the whole country's clocks. It resets the world's clocks. We didn't actually make that happen because it's probably illegal and we didn't really know how. We but did send a text to Greenwich, though, telling them that they should reset the clocks. Yeah. So another use case we thought of, say you're running late, you're supposed to be catching a train. Say, again, it's 3 o'clock, your train's at 4 o'clock, but you know you're going to miss it. Press the button, get an extra 20 minutes. 20 minutes later, it's 3 o'clock again. The train driver's like, oh, it's only 3 o'clock, don't have to go for another hour. You get there, you catch the train. Everything's fine. Now, it's maybe not quite so fine, because back at Evil Core, your colleagues are like, oh, God, this day's really dragging. I thought it was closer to 4 o'clock. It's still only 3 o'clock. Oh, I know. I'll press my button and get another 20 minutes. And everybody starts doing it. <laughs> and the day just gets longer and longer and longer. The sun starts setting and rising at really weird times. Now, we had this idea, and it was deliberately ridiculous. It was a joke, but we had a lot of fun, which hopefully you can tell. It's 2 p.m. I should be there. I'm 30 minutes late. Time for a time travel break. It's still 2 p.m. My train isn't late after all. Time travel, turning passenger misery into passenger delight. Time travel sends text to the people in Greenwich telling them to reset the clocks too. Time travel for the win. Oh, it's only 3 p.m. Three hours till home time. I'm going to click my time travel button. Oh, that's better. And look, it's still only 3 p.m. Our time travel app can hack your body clock. It's only 4 p.m. I can't work two more hours. I'm taking a nap. That's better. And look, it's still 4 p.m. Seriously, I've been in work for days and it's still 4 o'clock. Time travel messes with time so badly that nobody wins and your day never ends. Um, and I just want to thank my friends. So that loop of music is from a piece uh, called uh, Viva La Difference Engine, uh, which is about Babbage by my wonderful friends, the UK steampunk band, uh, the men will not, who will not be blamed for nothing. Um, and probably the most exciting thing of all is, and I'm not in the picture because I dashed home on the train to, uh, to my kids, um, we were the first all women team ever to win the coveted best in show at Hack Manchester. <laughs> So awesome, 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 and but also, in a way, a bit surprising, because if we look at this picture again, what we see is we're not your classic demographic here, okay? So this is a room, you can see Claire at the back there, I'm probably sitting on the floor somewhere, that's what I usually do. Um, so uh, very uh, white male, um, but if you zoom in as well, what you'll notice is there are a lot of things like there's a lot of coffee, there's a lot of monster drink, other energy drinks, there's a lot of sugar, there's a lot of people with uh, sleeping bags under the table, or we heard a lot of uh, daring each other to have the least sleep, I wonder who'll make it through, I wonder who won't sleep at all. Um, and we decided that we were going to do something really, really different. And actually, it was Luce who was absolutely adamant right from the beginning that our team would be all about self-care. So um, we had a side room 
we weren't in that big cavernous room because we knew like from a sensory perspective it was probably a little bit overwhelming. We had a side room with just a few other uh, teams in it um, and we were right in the corner of that room. We had our laptop stands, we set it all up just how we like. I took some calming aromatherapy incense oils, so we had all of that. But most importantly and most surprisingly possibly out of all of it, we slept. All of us, we slept. We talked about it before, we realized that Luce and Cynthia kind of like to go to bed early and get up early. So they left about 9.30ish, I think, and they came back about five o'clock in the morning. I was sort of in the middle, so I left about half past one, and I got back somewhere about seven or eight-ish. And Claire is really bad when she's like got her teeth into a problem, she won't let it go. So I think she went on till about half past three, but then she kind of came in the latest the next morning. So we all rested, we all slept. And just in case you're a bit of a process geek and you want to know what else we did, we did a very lightweight form of Agile. So behind us, you can see some sticky notes. We created a, again, very lightweight user story map so we could pick out what the smallest amount of things we could do to make a minimum sort of viable thing um, and that we could then build on. And we had one hour iterations, which consisted of 45 minutes working, five minutes kind of combined retrospective review, which was really us just going, oh, come over here, look at this really cool thing I finished. What should we do, what should we do next? And then uh, anything we need to change. And then every hour for 10 minutes, we took a break, no matter what. And that break was away from the desk as well. So we walked, around, we walked out, we maybe got a drink or got some fresh air, some or stretches. chatted to people, did some stretches. So actually, compared to most of the other teams, we spent an awful lot of time looking after ourselves. And we even had some sort of automated tests. Sal, hmm? haven't quite told the truth. You've made this sound like really, really amazing. And actually, this, this is my bad, because I did the thing that I do, which is where I get the bit between my teeth, and I get obsessed and I stay up till three or four in the morning, and then I don't get enough sleep. And uh, this is something that is uh, a problem <laughs> for me, to be honest. Um, and I, it's, this isn't the first time that I've done this, but the interesting thing about working on this app was that it really got us thinking about time. We were at a 25-hour hackathon where the time went back an hour in the middle. There were sleep experts there. We were making a time machine. It started out as a joke, but we started to think about some really serious issues to do with time. And the obvious one was sleep. I lose sleep because I want more time, but I know that actually I pay for it. So yes, I get more hours at the end of the day, and I can do that because I'm naturally an owl, and that's when my energy peaks, actually. So I can quite often get this big burst of energy in the middle of the night and just keep going and going and going, but then I pay for it. I pay for it the next day and quite often the day after that as well. And on balance, it's not actually worth it. The amount of time I gain is not really enough. Luckily, on this occasion, I had Sal and Luce and Cynthia to pick up the slack. But that's not always the case. Now, if we, I don't know how much you know about what happens when you sleep, but we sleep in cycles, and they typically last about 90 minutes long. On this diagram, a cycle is between peaks. So between two peaks, that's a cycle. And this is, in fact, an app called Sleep Cycle that I use. And I know a little bit about sleep cycles from a book that I read by a guy called Richard Ferber called Solve Your Child's Sleep Problems When My Children Were Babies. And he gives a really good example of what's happening when a baby wakes in the middle of the night and starts crying. To help you to understand that, he says, imagine that when you're in your deep sleep phase, when you're completely dead to the world, you're not even dreaming at that point, if somebody were to take your pillow away, gently, you wouldn't necessarily notice. But what would happen is the next time you reach one of those peaks, which is when you're close to being awake and sometimes actually are awake, you'd be like, huh, where's my pillow gone? And then you just kind of, you know, oh, it's probably just next to me. Oh, it's not there either. Oh, it's probably down the side of bed. Oh, it's not there either. Now you're awake. Now you're like, what, that somebody has stolen my pillow? You're awake, 
you're angry, you're pissed off. If you're a baby, you're crying. Now, for the baby, that's you. You were the pillow. When you rocked your baby to sleep, you stole that pillow while that baby was asleep. I love that example because it's such a nice way of explaining something called sleep associations, which we all have. For most people, it's a pillow, a bed, darkness, being horizontal. Now, the funniest thing, this app, the way it works, is that it's on my phone. My phone is by my bed at night, and it's listening to me. So it's listening to me breathe. It's listening to me snore. It actually records me snoring. You see those little waves at the bottom? If I pay extra, I get to listen to that. I... <laughs> to listen to myself snore. I've never done that. But if I wanted to, I could. So it's listening to me. It's listening to me breathe. It's listening to me move. It's putting that data together, and it's deducing my sleep cycles using that data. And the funny thing about this graph is that the second to last peak, which is about half past eight in the morning, Oh, something that I didn't tell you. The way that it works, it's also an alarm clock. That's why I have it. It's an alarm clock. And on this occasion, this is a real night's sleep. This is my sleep. On this occasion, I told her that I wanted to get up at half past nine in the morning. And what happened was at half past eight in the morning, my cats woke me. The way the app works is that you give it a, a window, and I've configured figured it to 45 minutes. So what that means is that I've told it, you can wake me at any time between quarter to nine and a half past nine. I don't mind you waking me at any part. I was lucky this morning. I, had to, I didn't have to get up till really late. Um, but what's happened is that at half past eight, the cats have woken me. What they do is they jump on my head, and they say, it's time for breakfast. And I say, no, it isn't. Um, but I'm awake, and I know that my app can tell that I'm awake. So now what am I going to do? Because I've got 15 minutes to get back to sleep again, because otherwise, what it does is if at quarter to nine, it can tell that I am where, in fact, I was, which is very close to the tip of a peak, it's not going to let me go back down into a deep sleep cycle. It's going to say, come on, you've got to get up. Because if you don't get up now, you're going to go into a deep sleep phase, and then I'm going to have to wake you up when you're deeply asleep. So, and it doesn't want to do that, because the whole point is if it doesn't wake you while you're deeply asleep, you will feel much more refreshed at that point and all day. So it wants to wake you close to one of the peaks. And I know that it's probably going to try and wake me up, make me get up, if it knows that I'm awake. So then what happens is I lie really still and really quiet, and I breathe really deeply, and I try and fool my phone into thinking that I'm deeply asleep so that it won't make me get out of bed. And then typically, it, then, then the alarm goes off, and I'm like, damn, it didn't work. And then, oh, no, it did work. It's half past nine. And what's actually happened is I did fall back to sleep, and it feels like I spent the whole time dreaming about trying to fool my phone. <laughs> but actually, dreams only last milliseconds, so really, I did just sleep. So, um, that's sleep cycles, but why do we need to sleep? Scientists don't really know what happens while we're asleep. They're not, well, not entirely sure, they've got some ideas. But they do know that if we don't get enough sleep, there are a lot of impacts. So sleep deficiency affects learning, focusing, reacting, judge, judging others' emotions and actions. It can make you frustrated, cranky, anxious. It's linked to heart disease, kidney disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, stroke, obesity, depression. It's responsible for car crash injuries and deaths. And it has played a role in several tragic accidents, including nuclear reactor meltdowns. There was a Doctor Who episode about sleep. It was called Sleep No More. And one of the writers was Mark Gattis. Uh, the Sleep No More episode had these monsters that lived in the sleep in the corner of your eyes that would get into your brain and melt you from the inside out. And what he said about that episode was, it's a satire on our working lives. In the future, we'll have no time at all. We'll have to work all the time. Really, what humanity is doing is bartering away the most blessed thing there is, sleeping. It's not just about having 40 winks, it's empirically right for us to do. Otherwise, the monsters will get us. 
And at the hackathon, there were actually sleep researchers there. So that was super cool. They decided that they wanted to come and look at the effects of people not, you know, trying to stay up all, way, uh, up all night. And also to help us understand this concept of larks and owls. So we have larks who typically will wake up in the morning and go to bed more early in the evening. And then we have some people like Claire who are owls who will happily stay awake way into the night, be super productive, but they need to lie on in the morning. And there's a kind of third, which is, which is sort of somewhere between the two. It's a kind of omni person that can, that can do either of them. And the researchers that were there at the hackathon did some fun stuff. So you could go up at various different points throughout the night. You could have your reaction times measured. You could uh, see your physical hand strength changing to try and work out whether you were a lark or an owl. And that was really helpful for us when we were thinking about who's going to go to sleep when. Um, and it turns out from the research that larks are in the majority. And actually, I don't think that's too much of a surprise. Because when you think about the way we're set up as a society, we're kind of quite disparaging towards owls, actually. We kind of think it's a bit lazy if you don't get up early in the morning, even if that's your natural cycle time. And when you think about it from an evolutionary psychology perspective, it makes total sense to have groups of people with differing sleep needs. Let's imagine we're in a family group or in a small village or a small group. Right? That's at risk of being attacked by, I don't know, you know, the people across the hill or wild animals or whatever it might be. If we all need to sleep for the same eight hours, every single night. That is a big window of opportunity in which we could get attacked. We're very vulnerable. Whereas if some of us can stay awake for some of those hours, maybe sleep on a little bit longer afterwards, and some of us go to sleep earlier but wake up earlier, maybe we're getting that eight hours of vulnerability down to four hours or even two hours. So from an evolutionary perspective, it makes absolute sense that we've got different needs in terms of sleep, and yet our society really isn't set up that way at all. And sleep needs obviously aren't the only way in which everyone's different. Anybody who knows me or seems, has seen me talk before will know that my, one of my massive passions is neurodiversity, different kinds of brains, different kinds of minds, people having different needs, and the fact that as an industry, we're not very good about, at supporting them yet. We're not very good in terms of the environments we expect people to work in. We're not very good in terms of the processes that we use either. And we're just starting to learn, I think, about how we can be more inclusive from a neurodiversity perspective. And equally, you might say, you know, the same for introverts and extroverts, or many, many different ways in which everybody's actually different. Um, and I'm pretty sure quite a few of you might already know this phrase, spoon theory, um, but I found it super, super helpful. So there's a lady called Christine Miserandino, hopefully I said that right, who uh, struggled with lupus. And um, in 2003, she coined this phrase of spoon theory. She was sitting down in a cafe or a restaurant with a friend of hers, trying to explain what it was like living with lupus. And she was like, I need some props to help me explain. So she collected all the spoons off the table, and then she nicked some spoons off the nearby tables as well, until she had 12 spoons. And she said, let's imagine I start the day with 12 spoons. When I get dressed, that takes four of my spoons away. When I get up, that takes another two of my spoons away. When I eat breakfast, that takes etc., etc. And if I don't pace myself and I run out of spoons, I don't have any more to give. I don't have any more capacity. I don't have any more energy to do stuff. And spoon theory, this idea of talking about things in terms of spoons, has been really kind of embraced by the neurodiversity movement and people in general. So you hear people say things like, I'm low on spoons or I'm out of spoons. It's a really good way of expressing the fact that, you know, today's been pretty tough on me so far and I'm getting low on spoons now. Um, 
so, so I'm, I'm going to need to recharge or I can't do that thing. It's kind of really helpful in terms of self-care. Um, so I really like the idea of spoon theory and I use it every day. The last thing I want to say about it, though, is just like all the things you hear about estimation, brilliant talk on estimation earlier today, you can't like calibrate spoons amongst individuals. So my spoon and Claire's spoon won't be the same. So if I start with day with like, say, 20 spoons, she might have 40, but her 40's got nothing to do with my 20. And different activities will take different numbers of spoons from different people, too. So it's a kind of personal tool to help you understand for you how many days you're starting the day, how many spoons you're starting the day with, and then what kind of activities take how many spoons from you. Oh, well, Sal, you didn't say the spoon thing. Okay, right. So there's quite a lot of Doctor Who in this uh, uh, in this presentation. I love Doctor Who. I don't think Claire knows this, but I used to go up to Manchester quite often and uh, stay in a really lovely hotel there. And because I've got a PhD, I'm allowed to use the title doctor. And they used to call me doctor the whole time. They'd be like, nice to see you again, doctor. Good morning, doctor. How was your day, doctor? And in my head, I was just doctor who the whole time I was there. Uh, <laughs> I didn't kind of hopefully let it out too much, but in my head I was. Um, and pretty much my all-time favorite Peter Capaldi moment is when he's kind of, somebody's threatening him a little bit, and he says, I'm the doctor. Look, I've even got a prop. And this is my spoon. So... There you go. This is my screen. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> okay. So, we've worked out that sleep matters. Rest matters. And work can really interfere with that. And so can parenthood. And combination of being a working parent can be a really difficult thing. So, what can we do about it? Well, the obvious thing for parents is flexible working. And, you know, those of you who aren't parents might not yet have had the shock of realising that the school day is really short. So, children start school at nine and finish at three. What's that all about? You know, I mean, that is not a working day. And if you are a working parent, you've got to somehow do something with them before and after school when you're at work. Are you, are you wanting to say something? You feel like, I feel like you're hovering. No. No, OK. <laughs> Just when I've got much time left. Oh, so. right, OK, cool. Um, so, flexible working. Give parents the flexibility to be able to do wraparound care. So don't make them all work nine to five. Let, if there's two parents, let one of them work really early and one of them work really late so they can do their start and the end of the school day. But it's not just about parents. In fact, if you allow your people to work flexibly, it means that they can cater to family needs, personal needs, boilers that need fixing. It means that they can pay attention to their own personal energy cycles. It means that they can do self-care. Um, so, uh, Linda Rising, I went to a great talk by Linda Rising last year about how your brain still works when you're resting. In fact, rather than spending hours focusing on a problem, you'll be more productive if you work a little bit and then rest a bit. And actually, um, I love Linda Rising, by the way. She's brilliant. If you ever get a chance to go to one of her talks, go to it. However, we've known about that since 1926. That's a model created by someone called Graham Wallace about creativity, the idea that you get some input and you go away and do something else that's called incubation and that will help you come up with a novel solution to the problem. And we've all seen that in tech, right? You're debugging, you can't solve something, you go home, you go to bed, you wake up in the morning, you have a shower or walk the dog or whatever and you're like, oh my God, how didn't I see this like really, really obvious solution? That's incubation working for you. Yeah, and if you don't pay attention to the fact that people have all these needs, they will just lie to you because they will have no choice. Because they still have to sort out their children and their ill relatives and their boilers and their own personal needs. And if you don't make room for that, they will just have to lie to you. You'll get absenteeism, you'll get lies. Um, so what people need is they need control over their own lives. They need to be able to say, I might come in early, I might come in late, I might work from home. I need to be able to do whatever the hell works for me. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't agree. As somebody autistic, I think structure can be really, really, really good. I think structure's great because it helps me coordinate with colleagues. It helps me coordinate with my family and clients. Everyone knows my availability. I've got this clear delineated line, which for my brain is really important between my home life and my work life. So some people 
no matter what you think about flexibility, some people thrive in a highly structured day, and just turns out I'm one of them. So what do we need? We need, we need to be self-aware. We need self-care. Um, I'm not sure that we need flexibility for everybody, but we do need empowerment, right? We need to be flexible about flexibility. <laughs> if that makes any sense at all. If they, let people have flexibility if they want it. But provide a structure if they don't. We can't live outside the clock, actually. But what we can do is recognize that clocks, hours, minutes, these are human constructs. These are concepts that we, as a race, have invented. And we invented them because they are useful to us. They allow us to coordinate with one another. But they don't have to be our masters. Sometimes you know you need to give yourself the permission to just put the finger up to um, the clock, to hours, and just say, you know what, I'm going to have a bit of downtime. I'm going to have a rest. I'm going to be late to work today. And that ought to be OK. Maybe the only person who can actually be your own personal time machine is you. Thank you.